2011 in the UK, but it actually goes back a lot further. It goes back to 1985 in the United States of America, mostly set up by uh, veterans of the war in Vietnam who were disturbed during the uh, mid-1980s about uh, American sort of undercover wars in Central America to see similarities between those wars and the war in Vietnam. Uh, within the UK, we've got ex-service people going back to 1944. You might have seen Jim Radford, a D-Day veteran, uh, during the 70th anniversary celebrations recently. He was at the Royal Albert Hall. He, he was on a, a cookery show. Needless to say, he tried to get his anti-war message out, but the, the editing kind of mm. put an end to that. You know, the, the couple of times he managed it was live, you know, on, live on Radio 4, he managed to, to really cut into it. But how is it that, um, that a trained soldier, how is it that these trained servicemen uh, come to join an organisation that is committed to the abolition of war? Well, I've thought about this a lot. And um, when I first left the military, I'd be speaking to guys who, who were no way anti-war, who, or who would no way say they were anti-war. But when you listen to their stories, when you listen carefully, after you got through the first 10 minutes of sort of, you know, bullshit, um, what you were hearing was an anti-war story. And whether, whether veterans have, have come to this realisation or not, I think what happens is that we realise that what we were asked to do, or what we were involved in, was irrational, or immoral, or illegal, or a combination of those things. Now sometimes it takes a long time for a veteran to realise that what they were involved in was irrational, immoral, or illegal. Some of us realise, whilst we're still serving, uh, within Veterans for Peace, there's myself, Joe Glenton and Mike Lyons who refused to carry on serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. But we've also got guys who, who maybe it took 20 years to get to that place. 20 years to realise that what they were involved in was irrational or immoral or illegal. And I suppose that, that begs the question, why? Why does it take such a long time uh, for veterans or soldiers to realise this? Realise what they're doing is actually against their own interests, against the interests of humanity. And I think it's actually down, in part, to a process called, that I call, and uh, you, know, you can argue with me about the definition here, compartmentalisation. And that means that things are split up into small parts where people can only see a small part of what is going on. And in fact, that's what's going on in our society. Why is it that when Britain and America have been at war continuously since the Second World War, and overtly continuously since 2001, that this room is so small that most of the people in this room, I recognise that most of these people in this room are over 50. It's due to compartmentalisation. It means that uh, a youth growing up in this country can hear all about the war in Afghanistan but never come close to understanding what it's truly about. It means that a soldier can actually deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan and never understand what it's truly about. And I'm just going to give a little example about how that works. So during 2005 in Iraq, I was deployed to Iraq. I was deployed to a special operations unit in Baghdad. There were people who were deployed to Iraq at the same time who spent the whole time in a base in Bajra that was, in effect, like a military butling. Okay? They never went outside the wire. They never met an Iraqi. Um, there were bars there. There were restaurants. There was a gym. They played football. They watched films in the night time. Now, their experience of that war was pretty positive. Their experience was actually, I had a fun time. I never hurt anyone. What, the war in Iraq was bad? No, I never did anything bad to anyone. When you ask them what their job was, well, what did he do? Oh, I was, um, I was in charge of the fuel. Oh, well, what did that involve? Oh, well, these helicopters used to land, and I used to put the fuel in them, and then they'd take off again. Well, where do you think these helicopters were going? Oh. Oh, wait a minute. And that's why it takes a while. It takes a while for some people to realise that their involvement in these things is, is kept separate. And they only see a small part of what's going on so that they can continue to do it. And I'm just going to give a brief example, I know we're short of time here, about, about the, 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 um, the system of compartmentalisation that was in process in Baghdad at the time. On the team, uh, myself and my colleagues were told that we were there to detain what we called high-value targets. People who were of uh, the utmost importance, people who were involved in opposing the occupation. We called them terrorists or insurgents. How that process started was that there was a small team of people who went out and gathered intelligence. Now, for the most part, as far as I'm aware, there's two ways of gathering intelligence. Human intelligence, signals intelligence. 
We all know through the Edward Snowden revelations that signals intelligence pervades all of our lives every moment. You know, if you carry a smartphone, you're part of the process. Human intelligence, no matter what you might have seen in James Bond films or, you know, spooks or all these other programs, involves paying people money. It's about paying people money. You offer money for people to grass up their uh, fellow um, country. Now, the first time that someone comes in to offer up intelligence for money, they might have some real intelligence. They might actually know someone who's involved in the intelligence. However, during my time in Iraq, out of the hundreds of people who were, who were detained, only about 10% were actually assessed after interrogation to be part of the insurgency. And after further interrogation, that number went down to 2%. So who were all these other people that we were detaining? Well, when you pay for intelligence in a country with high employment, high rates of poverty, and if you're going to grasp someone up to the occupying forces, you might as well grasp someone up you don't like. <laughs> I, I, I firmly believe that many of the ways I was involved in, we were actually taking out people who were uh, of a different religious sect, of a different tribe, maybe some family, a, a family that someone had been involved in over the years, you know, uh, competing business interests. Who knows what this is all about? But that's how it all starts off. Now, the people who gain this intelligence are not involved, they hand over that information to a surveillance team, and that's the end of their involvement. So, all they say, they just been an exchange of money. What happens next is a surveillance team is tasked to look at certain properties, certain individuals, and they've been told that these people are involved in the insurgency. So from the start, they're looking at these people with suspicious minds. They see someone digging in the garden, they must be hiding weapons. They see someone taking their kids to school and putting bags in the back of the way to school. Oh, this is just a cover for, for moving stuff around. They see someone going to someone else's house, rather than just thinking these might be friends or family, this is part of a bigger terrorist network, obviously. So the people doing the surveillance, they build up this huge picture of, of these fr friends and family and you know, all these activities and everything's looked through suspicious eyes. And then they've passed that on to another team, and that's the end of their involvement. So they have seen these people in their normal day-to-day -day lives, shopping, taking their kids to school, um, you know, conversing with friends and the family, digging in the garden. And then they hand over the job to the team that I was involved in. And what we used to do, in the middle of the night, we would sneak up to these people's houses, and I just want to you to imagine that this is your house. And we would place explosives on the door, or place explosives on the wall, and, and explode our way into your house. And before you knew what was going on, there'd be a huge explosion, your house would be full of dust, it's still dark, and before you've even regained your senses, there are 20 men, armed men, heavy men, rampaging through your house. And we've, uh, we've exploited every single space, every room. And we're dragging you out of your bed. And we're dragging all the males into one room. And we're dragging all the females and the children into another room. And you're being held at gunpoint. Now, if you're a male, you're being, um, you're being interrogated in a brutal way now. Shouted at. Maybe pushed against the wall, smashed around a bit. And we're pointing the weapon at you and we're trying to get information out of you. The children and the women are held in another room. <coughs> Whilst this is going on, my job was to go around your house and tear it to pieces. Rip open your cupboards, rip open your drawers, turn everything upside down. Just drag everything out, we didn't give a shit. And we were looking for phones, money, computers, all of your valuable documents and any weapons you might have in the house. And I know some of the cynical people in the room will be thinking, ah, oh, weapons. Every family in Iraq had a weapon. It's a very dangerous place. There's a culture in the Arab world of males having weapons anyway as a form of status. So don't go putting our own Western values onto this. Within 20 minutes, we'd have dragged the males out of the house. We'd have had them cuffed with a hood on their head, with earphones on their ears, with all this family's possessions. And we'd leave these families in a home where we destroyed uh, the security of the home. There'd be no door left or a big hole in the wall. We'd taken all their money, we'd taken all their phones. Imagine this, imagine waking up tomorrow with none of this. All your bank statements, all your documents, your birth certificates, everything. And we'd taken away the one person who could provide security for you, who could go out and earn some money. And also, thinking about Arab society, where the male is seen as a hero, we had humiliated that person in front of his family. And this is what we were doing every night. And me personally, I don't have gone too long. Me personally, 
I started to look at the children, look at the females, the way they were looking at me, and thinking, what must they be thinking about us? As someone who grew up on the stories, the myths, the stories of World War II, about how we confronted Nazi Germany, about how we held the line against communist Russia, we were those people. Anyway, the next part of the process is we bring these people back to our base. We then hand them over to the interrogation team. By this time, the Arab man has got a hood on his head, he's cuffed, he's wearing the dish dash, the, the sort of traditional dress that people wear to go to sleep. Maybe he's pissed himself. What does he look like? What does he look like to that interrogator? What, imagine that picture. What, what, what do we associate that image with? We associate it with being a terrorist. Who would make them look like that? Who would turn them into the terrorists? We have. And so by the time they go into the interrogation process, that person has been dehumanised. By the time they go into the prison and face the long periods of torture, they're no longer looking at the person the surveillance team was looking at. They're no longer looking at the, the person taking their children to school. Or, or, you know, digging in the garden. They're looking at someone who, who's terrified with, the, with, with these accessories. And that is, that is the process of compartmentalisation. Where you break up something abhorrent into small, easily digestible parts. Where all of the people involved in this process can say, all I did was pay the man some money. All I did was drag him out of their house. All I did was torture a terrorist. And that's how this works. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than a special operations you know, unit in Baghdad. It's our whole society. It's about embedded journalists. So that you people back home don't actually see what's going on. It's about the constant militarism that goes on in, in our society, which has increased in the last 10 years. So that you've got kids, right, who... who I, I heard this the other night in a meeting. I'm in the cadet force, I'm anti-war, I believe in peace, um, but the cadet force really does it for me, it's really fun. Um, they don't want us to join the military, it's really fun, I really enjoy it. And they couldn't see the sort of contradiction going on there between being a part of the, the cadet force and being anti-war. Um, um, so, so this is what's going on. We're all being put into these little boxes and we're only being seen or shown a small part of what's going on and it's making us capable of carrying out our lives as if nothing's going on. Because another thing that's happened, and David was mentioning this earlier in a, in a meeting this afternoon, is that all, a lot of our anti-war work is Western-based. How many British soldiers have been killed? How many British soldiers have got PTSD? What about all the Iraqis? What about the Afghans? If there's 10,000 British soldiers with PTSD, I can guarantee there's a million Iraqis with PTSD. You know, if 1,000 British soldiers died in Afghanistan, and it's more like 400, 10 or, or 20,000 Afghans have died during that war. And we're looking at these things through Western-centric eyes. And what we've got to do is to try and educate our children to understand what's really going on and to get them to empathise with people outside of our own societies. So what's Veterans for Peace up to? We're up to, we're involved in three things. Education. And that basically involves a school project where we send veterans into people's schools and we, and we basically tell the children about our own experiences. How it was that we came to join the army so that those children will be aware of how people are recruited into the military. And there are many reasons. What army was training was like, so that those children can understand how a, a peaceful civilian can be turned into a hateful killer. And what war was like, as opposed to what these children are taught through films and computer games and comic books, coming from someone who was there. So that's our education uh, program. We're also involved in non-violent resistance. An example of this is uh, every year at the Cenotaph, it, it, on Remembrance Sunday, when the, when the big parade has gone down there, and the EDL has gone down there, and the Salvation Army has gone down there, we go down there. And we go and lay the only roof of white poppies at the Cenotaph. And we're the only organisation that goes down there to remember all the war dead. Because the Royal British Legion, I've confronted them about this. I said, they said to me, oh Ben, why don't you get veterans of peace to join the official parade? And I said, well next year we'll have some German veterans with us. Is it okay if they join us? The stony face, German soldiers, you know, even though that these guys are actually fighting with us in Afghanistan, the thought of a German soldier going to the Senator was abhorrent to this woman.
because the, the remembrance in this country is entirely UK based. It's about our dead, it's about our loss, it's, and it's got nothing to do with the pain and torture and destruction that we've inflicted on other countries. And the other work we're involved in is solidarity. And a brief example of this, in October this year, we'll be heading out to Northern Ireland. Ten Northern Ireland veterans will be on joint platforms with an organisation called COISTA, which are former uh, Republican Army prisoners. And we'll be uh, speaking on joint platforms about our, our own experiences of that conflict in Northern Ireland to try and get some sort of understanding about what was actually happening. Because again, there was compartmentalisation going on there. You know, we all had our own little views about what was going on and none of us really know what was really going on. I'll just quickly finish, if that's all right, to say, right, how can you help us if you're interested in how you can help Veterans for Peace? If you're a veteran, if you know a veteran, join us, okay? Go on the website and join. If you've got access to schools, you're a teacher, you know a teacher, your daughter's a teacher, put the idea forward to let us into the schools. The military are allowed into schools. The military take all their weapons and their videos and all their money into the schools and try and teach our kids that being a British soldier is the most noble thing you can do. Well, if you don't think that's right, Get us into the schools. We've got veterans trained to go into schools and give these workshops. Um, you can join us at the Cenotaph. When we go to the Cenotaph, we have the veterans in the front to take the, uh, the white poppies down there. But we're also followed by people in funeral dress. So just wear black, wear what you'd wear to a funeral, to join us, to make this a bigger thing. Because I think that people in this country are fed up. Fed up with the way that we're told how to remember these wars, and fed up to the way we're, we're told we have to wear a poppy and we have to support the troops. So if you don't agree with that, come and join us on uh, Remembrance Sunday every year. And, um, mm. and the last thing is if you're involved in non-violent resistance to war and militarism, or if you know someone who's involved, if you know someone who's facing a trial, then tell us about it. Because we are interested in supporting non-violent resistors, whether that's military resistors or civilian resistors. On Friday, we'll be outside uh, Stratford Magistrates Court. A young, um, a young guy called Dan Ashman uh, blockaded the arms fair in September. Uh, the reason he gave when he was arrested was that they were selling torture equipment in there. He was taken to the police cell in charge. It actually turned out a few days later, they were selling torture equipment in there, and that firm was kicked out. Now, that should have been the end of the case, but Dan's uh, facing a magistrate's trial on, on Friday, Stratford, 9.30. And, and that's the sort of people that we're interested in supporting. Um, and also, uh, well beyond war. Now, I was at a meeting earlier, and there was some sort of cynicism or scepticism about world beyond war. And I can understand that. Because sometimes when we're faced with these things, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is this a front organisation? What am I getting involved in here? Well, I know David. I first met David two years ago at, um, in Miami at, at the Veterans Peace Convention. And I also know Leah Bolger very well, who's also involved in this. And this is not a front organisation. These are well-meaning people. Veterans of Peace UK has signed up to World Beyond War because we believe in these people and we believe in the idea of it. And I know for those people who've been around the peace movement a lot longer than me, um, you'll be thinking, well, we've had these organisations before and it hasn't worked and it's fallen apart. But, you know, we've got to keep trying, surely. Um, so I really urge you, as a final, you know, sort of final message, is to check out the website. Check out the World Beyond War website because actually I tell the Veterans for Peace to check it out. Because if you're unsure about how to defend an abolition of war position, this website gives you the tools. Why war is illegal, why it's immoral, and what we can do about it. Thanks a lot.